Motion graphics is traditional graphic design with type, images, and graphic elements, plus the added dimension of time. Motion graphics are used in a wide variety of settings, such as movies, TV programming, game design, wayfinding, and user interfaces, to name but a few. Motion graphics is often called motion design, and this series uses these terms interchangeably. A motion designer is someone who makes motion graphics or motion designs. Motion graphics, like all visual art and design that is expressed two-dimensionally, can be described using the elements and principles of design. The elements of design are the abstract components used to create imagery. They are usually described in a static context where motion or movement is not an element, or only implied. These are point, line, shape, volume, color, texture, and space. A motion designer will need to understand these elements and how they relate to time-based media. They will also need to use the principles of design to organize them. Designers use the principles of design to solve design problems. The principles are based on Gestalt theory, which basically means that when we see something visual, we inherently form relationships between the elements in a way that will make sense to us. Which principles are used depends on the desired outcomes. The principles vary in nomenclature within design disciplines, but the concepts are the same. They are unity, balance, visual hierarchy, and variety. There's a lot to each of these. We'll talk more about them in later segments and what it might mean for these to change over time. Motion graphics is animated graphic design. All motion graphics is animation, but not all animation is motion graphics. Still, the dividing line can get pretty blurry. Consider this moment in the introduction credits to the 1978 movie, The Revenge of the Pink Panther, where the two characters are more graphical representations of their cartoon counterparts. They try to shoot at each other, just at a slower frame rate and in the style of an arcade game. Is this traditional animation or traditional motion graphics? The next scene blurs the line even further when the letters that form the word Kato morph into the cartoon elements to Karate Chop in Spectre Clouseau. Whether or not we decide it's traditional animation or motion graphics, a motion designer will benefit by understanding the principles of animation. The 12 principles of animation were codified by Disney animators Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas in the book The Illusion of Life Disney Animation. These principles aided traditional cell animators in creating more convincing, lifelike animation for characters, and they still apply, even in today's computer-dominated animation industry. The 12 principles are Squash and Stretch Characters, in order to look alive, should be pliable, but should retain their volume when deformed. Anticipation is an action or pose that lets the audience know what will happen next. Staging deals with composing the elements or actions in the frame to direct the audience's attention or make what is happening as clear as possible. Straight ahead and pose to pose are different methods of creating animation. Straight ahead means to create animation frame by frame, whereas pose to pose establishes the major actions first and then goes back and fills in the details later. Follow through and overlapping action are critical in conveying that the objects or characters obey the laws of physics. If a character stops suddenly, its hat may fall forward or even fall off. Additionally, if a character is standing in a brisk wind, its clothes and hair will ripple to show the moving air. Slow in and slow out. Real objects accelerate or decelerate rather than suddenly starting or stopping. Arcs is the natural path objects take, 
such as a thrown ball or the swinging of the arms. Secondary action is any separate action that supports or enhances the primary action. Timing is the most critical element in all of animation as it refers to how many frames will be needed to properly convey an action. Exaggeration is any action or pose taken to its extreme to enhance the appeal of a moment or scene. Solid drawing simply means that 3D objects presented on a two-dimensional screen must be represented correctly as they move or rotate in space. For the traditional animator, this means knowing how to draw well and understanding physics. The last principle is appeal, which simply means that all animation must have some entertainment value or otherwise be interesting to the viewer. Motion designers are animators and should know and understand the 12 principles of animation. Ultimately, the intent for a motion designer is to create motion graphics that someone will experience. Which principles of design and animation are to be used can only be decided when the message and audience are well understood. The typography, composition, lighting, style, graphical elements, motion and sound can be drastically different if the content is intended for older adults versus a younger audience, both of which have distinct tastes and viewing cultures. All time-based media experiences are interpretations of our daily experiences viewed on some kind of screen, whether that be TV, a movie theater screen, tablet, or phone. We interpret motion on a screen similar to how we do events in real life, with varying degrees of disconnect. For example, if you're watching a scary movie, you might feel suspense or fear, just like you would if you were really in that situation but you also understand that what you're seeing isn't really happening. Of course, there are exceptions, like news video or documentaries. In the latter context, the experience is meant to represent reality. Usually, however, the viewer understands they are experiencing a representation and not an actual event. What is interesting is that everything we see on our digital screens is just a bunch of pixels or dots. And yet, our brains are perfectly capable of turning this pixel data into recognizable events. This gestalt for motion is similar to how a designer would interpret a static image. But now our brains are trying to make sense of how and why things are moving or not moving. We do so based off our evolution and traits that were selected for successfully interpreting the meaning of motion. You might have noticed the trees and leaves first but I guarantee that you're looking at those eyes and wondering what comes next. That's because you come from a long line of people who successfully interpreted the meaning behind the motion and didn't get eaten. <laughs> Screens, of course, vary wildly, from large theaters all the way down to smartwatches and everything in between. While these size differences matter, there are other things to consider. How tall and wide a screen is, is its aspect ratio. A common ratio for theater is 1.85 to 1. This means one unit tall and 1.85 units wide. The widescreen movie ratio is one unit tall and 2.4 units wide. High definition television format is 1.78 to 1, often called 16 by 9. Almost all screens today are digital, so images are made of pixels. These pixels are usually square and is defined by its resolution, which is determined by the number of pixels in a screen. For example, high definition television has multiple pixel densities that all follow the 16 by 9 aspect ratio. 1280 by 720 pixels is called 720p and stands for 1280 pixels wide by 720 pixels high. In the same high def 16 by 9 aspect ratio, there is also 1920 by 1080, which is called 1080p, 
and is the exact same ratio as 720p. But because it has a higher pixel density, it produces a sharper image. There are even higher pixel densities that produce even sharper imagery. Another important quality of time-based experiences is frame rate, or how many frames are used in each second to generate motion. Film is often 24 frames per second, while TV and other content is 30 frames per second. Games often need even higher frame rates. The more frames, the smoother the video will look. In the end, these screens provide a frame for moving compositions, and each frame shows a possible change in the elements of design over time. One way to approach motion design is to examine how the elements of design can change over time. With a 2D screen, there are only so many categories of ways that these elements can be modified frame to frame. The following isn't meant as an exhaustive review of the elements of design, but rather an exploration of how they can change over time. Let's take this square for example. If we want to change it over time, what are our options? We can move it left or right, up or down, or scale it up or down. The square can also be rotated left or right. This is, of course, just two-dimensional manipulation. Any moving, scaling, and rotating are called transformations. A third dimension can only be implied, as the screen we're watching remains two-dimensional, Still, our brains are perfectly capable of understanding implied depth. The concept of a camera is important when understanding how the elements of design can change over time. A real or digital camera does two primary things. First, it translates real or digital 3D events to a 2D screen. And second, it represents your point of view. The camera is a proxy for your eyes. When we look at filmed content, we know that there was a camera that captured it. There isn't a real camera that captures digitally created motion designs or animation. However, the concept of what a camera is and can do is the same even in a digital context. The camera can move or stay put. In digital applications, there is often a camera that behaves like real cameras. Some transformations of an object and of the camera produce visually identical outcomes. Scaling the cube, for example, is the same as moving the cube closer or farther away from the camera. In another example, moving an object to the left or moving your camera to the right look the same to the viewer. The only way to distinguish these movements is with the inclusion of other objects in your scene that act as a visual reference. One of the simplest elements of design is the point. Points can go through transformations recently mentioned. The concept of the point here is pretty important. Besides being the most basic of representations, it is also the most closely related to the screen-based format we would see it on. At its most fundamental, the point on a screen cannot be smaller than the pixel that would represent it. Points can use color and proximity to create an image. This technique is called pointillism, and the points used can change these values over time. Geometric points have no size, but visual points must have a size, and that size can also vary somewhat, and therefore change over time, to affect the overall image. Here the boundary between a point and a shape is heavily blurred. You can easily see how a point could morph to a shape with little effort. The only thing required for a point to be a point is for your brain to see it as a point, if the point is really a very small elephant, it doesn't matter, as long as you're not concentrating on the elephant, but rather, what they create when they're seen as a group.
Line is the next basic element of design, and each of its properties can also change over time. Lines can be curvilinear, meaning that they change direction smoothly, or rectilinear, where they change direction sharply. Of course, a line can also have both qualities. Another property of lines that can change over time is thickness. Lines can be thin, thick, varied, and implied, and all these qualities are modifiable over time. There is an important quality about a moving line that is different than the static image. If a line first appears at the edge of the frame and moves into the center, our brains do something a little weird. We subconsciously question how long the line is. This is because our brains need to know, but we don't know. The longer the line becomes while one side remains touching the edge of the frame, the more we think the line off screen approaches infinite length. But this isn't true if the line starts with both ends on screen and one end touches the edge of the frame. Shape is the next basic element of design, and one of its most important. Shape is the outline of forms, and is how we recognize objects. If you see an outline of an animal, you know which one it is simply by its shape, rather than any details it might have. Shapes have all kinds of classifications, from realistic, to stylized, to abstract. Shapes can morph from one type to another. Shape changing over time can be something we recognize, something stylized, or something imagined. How a shape changes over time can give important clues to the shape's meaning. Perhaps this turtle lives near a nuclear power plant, or is an alien species. Volume is an element of design that must be implied on screens. 2D shapes have width and height, but 3D shapes have depth. Because screens only have two dimensions, that depth must be interpreted. This can be done realistically or stylistically. Light, shadow, and shading, and viewing the shape from different angles all aid in convincing the viewer of implied volume on a 2D screen. Changing volume over time is a critical feature of interpreting the state of implied 3D objects. For example, if we squeeze a ball with two cubes, how it changes shape gives clues to the viewer as to what is happening. Here, the ball looks like it might be reaching its breaking point because of how extreme the shape change is. However, the volume of the object hasn't changed much, only its shape. We subconsciously realize that if there is too much pressure on the ball, it might lose its ability to retain its volume. For the volume of an object to change, its shape should either get bigger or smaller in some manner. The reasons for it getting bigger or smaller should be apparent, even if it appears magical. A balloon is a good example of an object that we understand undergoes a volume change. It can decrease in volume because air was removed, or it could increase in volume because air was added. How it increases or decreases, how fast it happens, and any associated sounds we hear give clues to how to interpret what is happening to the balloon. Space can be thought of in a number of ways. The term negative space is the space that is not occupied by shapes. The relationship between shape and space is called figure ground. Sometimes the negative space is a strong element, while other times it is subdued. If a shape is changing its outline, then the negative space is also changing with it. This could produce interesting effects that are only understood in the context of change. The surface properties of a shape constitute its texture. All digital representations of texture are implied, as you can't actually touch them. Texture can be broken down into simpler elements, like point, line, shape, and color, but together they form a recognizable property. For example, even though this is a close-up, you probably know it is a tree because of the familiar patterns that constitute tree bark. For texture to change would mean that an object's surface properties would change. For example, 
an apple could go from its familiar representation to a metallic one. There are many examples of this change in texture being used, and usually we interpret such changes to mean that the fundamental substance of an object is changing. Of all the elements of design and how they change over time, color is unique. It is the only element that cannot morph into another element. A point can become a line, which can become a shape, which can become a volume. Figure and ground can change places. Texture can be reduced to a combination of elements. But color is always color, and all the other elements always have a color. From a physiological perspective, color is what the brain uses to distinguish each element of design, since our visual processes are built to see color and value variations. The brain interprets elements from differences in contrast. Certain colors and color combinations also affect the brain's mood. This makes it one of the most powerful elements in terms of how it might affect the viewer. Color is the combination of hue, saturation, and value. Hue is what we would normally say the color of an object is, for example, red or blue. Saturation is how much of that color is present. Value is how much black or white is mixed with its color. Volumes have been written about color, but when it comes to change over time, color is very simple. All you can change is an element's hue, saturation, and value. Also, an element must have a value, but not necessarily a hue. This establishes value as the most fundamental element of design. All of the elements of design are derived from contrasts in value. Furthermore, this means all motion is derived from perceived changes in value. Even though color and how it changes is easy to describe, it is often considered the most complex of all elements of design. Even though you can only change three different properties of color, its hue, saturation, or value, this results in a near infinite number of possibilities. This makes understanding how people will interpret color changes incredibly challenging. Some color changes are well understood, however. One of the most common color changes is from a warmer color to a cooler color, which invokes a mood of dread or foreboding. The opposite, from cooler to warmer, invites an emotional response of hope, respite, or relief. To have both warm and cold colors on screen could mean a battle of good versus evil. The change between these colors is a common technique in cinematography. Remember, change in color is really change in hue, saturation, or value. Some of these changes have readily understood meanings, but because there are so many combinations, it leaves a lot of room for exploration and experimentation. Color pairing is also an important consideration in design. Color pairing is well understood, but changes in color pairing over time and its impact is less well understood. The principles of design explain how the elements of design achieve a desired visual outcome. They are the organizing methods based on Gestalt a term which means that when we see an image, our brains will attempt to make sense of it. Motion designers have the added necessity of understanding how change over time of the elements of design will affect the principles of design, and how to categorize motion into their own principles. More on that in the next segment. One of these design principles is unity, which is sometimes called harmony. In simple terms, it means that the elements in the design look alike, or can readily form relationships according to other principles, like balance, repetition, rhythm, or proximity. Designs that aren't harmonious often appear messy and unpleasant to look at. A second principle, balance, is the idea that a design's visual elements have weight, and a well-balanced image will have that weight evenly distributed versus an image that is imbalanced. An image can have symmetrical balance, where the weight is reflected around a focal point, or asymmetrically balanced, where there is no obvious focal point and no reflection, but the image still appears balanced. What does motion have to do with balance? 
motion within a balanced composition, can either break that balance or maintain that balance. Motion in compositions that aren't balanced can either maintain that imbalance or change to achieve balance. Objects can also move symmetrically or asymmetrically. Radial symmetry and corresponding motions are a kind of balance. Another principle of design, repetition, means that an element is repeated throughout the design. The element could be point, line, shape, color, volume, space, or texture. Motion is also a design element. Elements can move, rotate, scale, change their color, or morph into other elements. You can apply these motions to other elements for repetition in motion. Repetition in motion means that a particular change over time is applied to more than one element in a design. Rhythm means that there will be a detectable pattern of motion in those objects. Rhythm in motion could be applied to a design that already has rhythm in shape, for example, to emphasize the rhythm. In this example, several motions are repeated in a pattern to show rhythm in motion. The principle of proximity in design usually refers to how close or how far away objects are from each other. Grouping objects is a way to show their relationship. The principle of proximity in motion, though, is quite different and shouldn't be confused with spatial proximity. It simply means how similar or how different are the changes over time for each element. In this example, there are three kinds of motion, moving, rotating, and scaling. If we also spatially group these objects by their categories of motion, we can further emphasize the similarity in their motions as well as their spatial relationship. Even though they are different forms, they look like they belong together. The principle of visual hierarchy says that some elements are more likely to be noticed before other elements in a design. For example, large and bold text is more likely to be noticed first than smaller text. Objects that only have a value will give way to ones with color. Motion is unique in that it can visually overpower all other elements. Let's go back to that big, bold text and the small text. If we give that small text, say, a jiggling motion, well, guess what you're looking at now? This means that designs should use motion carefully. Traditional design approaches can quickly become upended as soon as motion is introduced. A rule of thumb is that the more energy an element appears to have, the more likely we are to notice it. For example, how fast things move on the screen is directly proportional to how likely we are to track it. If too many items on the screen are in motion, it will quickly overwhelm our ability to make sense of the design and it will appear chaotic. Graphic designers use grid systems to establish continuity for a design experience. A website might use a similar layout from page to page to make the experience more familiar. An icon set might use an underlying grid so that the different icons have a similar look and feel. What would happen if we allow the grid to change over time? Static continuity is now impossible, but designers can use continuity in motion to organize elements and information. The principles of design describe ways that our brains attempt to make sense of what we see. The principles of motion design are similar. They describe ways that our brains attempt to make sense of motion. Here are three principles of motion design that provide important ways to understand the design elements changing over time. I want to emphasize that these are not the only way to understand motion, but for designers they may appear familiar. These are motion hierarchy, unity in motion, and variety in motion. The first principle is motion hierarchy and is related to the principle of visual hierarchy for static images. Motion hierarchy is the idea that the type of motion an element has contributes to its visual weight and that some motions will outweigh others. As you can imagine, there are many categories of motion only some of which will be discussed here. Determining motion hierarchy is very tricky, but a general rule is that the more energy we perceive an object to have, the more likely we are to look at it. 
energy, in this case, can be related to how quickly it changes over time. Things that change slowly will lose out to things that change quickly. The types of elements used in the motion design can also contribute to their perceived energy level. For example, rotating a circle really fast has no effect on visual energy because a rotating circle isn't something we can detect. If we change the circle's shape as it rotates, its perceived energy level will begin to change too. Different rotating shapes will reveal different energy levels, even if all the shapes are rotating at the same rate. If we put these shapes side by side, which one appears to have more energy to the viewer? There is a limit to how much energy you can add to an object's motion to increase its visual weight. If our eyes can no longer track an object because it is changing too fast, it will lose out to objects we can track. This is its energy tracking limit. Furthermore, if too many objects are moving at once, our eyes will have trouble tracking any of them, no matter their energy level. This can be a useful way to create focal points using motion. The second principle of motion design is unity in motion. Unity in static design means that all the elements come together in a harmonious way. This applies to motion as well. The subcategories of unity in motion were talked about in the previous segment and are balance in motion, repetition in motion, rhythm in motion, and proximity in motion. A design that uses disparate motions without consideration for their interpreted meanings will appear chaotic. Together, the principles of motion hierarchy and unity in motion are related to the third principle of animation, staging, which is the idea that elements and actions in the frame are arranged to direct the audience's attention and to make what is happening as clear as possible. Understanding motion hierarchy and unity in motion will aid in staging. One way to know if unity in motion has been achieved is to ask, first, does it make sense on its own? And second, does the motion make sense for the design? For example, if we see a car on a road, we have certain expectations for the car's motion. We've seen cars move a lot, so if a car is going to behave differently, say, fly away, it better be for a reason that makes sense for that design goal, like a flying car. The third principle of motion is variety in motion. Of the three principles of motion design, variety in motion is the most complex. Variety creates contrasts, and just like contrasts in static design, motion contrasts help us make sense of what we are seeing. Here are 11 motion contrasts to consider. The first contrast in motion is there versus not there. If an object appears and has enough visual weight, our eyes will be immediately drawn to it. The brain needs to analyze new objects that enter our visual field. This means that a lot of attention will be given to elements that suddenly appear. Technically, this is still a motion. The element isn't necessarily translating, rotating, scaling, or morphing, but it is changing its value, even if suddenly. The second contrast in motion is motion versus no motion. After an object enters the visual field, the brain will determine if it is changing over time. If there is no motion, the brain puts it into one of two categories, things that don't move, or things that can move but aren't moving at the moment. A threat level is assigned to both categories. If the object is moving, then the brain moves to the next step in categorization. The third contrast in motion is safe versus not safe. Our brains have evolved over millions of years to perform critical tasks. One of those is to keep us alive. If you see knives coming swiftly at you, your brain will see that motion and know that you need to duck to prevent you from being injured or killed. One of the reasons motion is such a powerful element of design is that it taps into such a fundamental cognitive task. The fourth contrast in motion is meaningful versus mysterious. When our brains detect motion, it attempts to derive meaning from it. 
Common motions are the easiest for us to understand. For example, a door to a room opening, a light turning on, or an airplane flying overhead. These are easy to comprehend. Other motions may not make sense to us and defy easy categorization. These could be uncommon or unusual motions, such as those described in UFO sightings. There may be motions that simply defy categorization. The fifth contrast is imperceptible motion versus perceptible motion. Anyone who has watched a sunset or taken care of plants has experienced change over time that takes place below our ability to detect directly. We do not watch a seed push through the dirt and grow, but rather we make comparisons in our day-to-day -day memory to infer motion. This is why time-lapse photography is so useful. It speeds up events so that we can understand the motion. Motion designers can also use imperceptible motion versus perceptible motion as a design element. For example, this animation timepiece lasts an entire 24 hours. Many of its pieces use perceptible motion, but other elements move imperceptibly. Their motions can only be perceived through memory comparisons made throughout the day. The sixth contrast is smooth motion versus sudden motion. Most things that we pay attention to happen at what we would call a normal pace, not too fast or too slow. However, some things happen quickly with rapid acceleration, like a gun firing a bullet, while other things take their time and don't change very quickly, like a snail climbing a tree. We categorize smooth or sudden motions based on our experiences, and we expect these motions to line up with our expectations. The seventh contrast is expected motion versus unexpected motion. As a motion designer, you have the choice of keeping these expectations or breaking them, depending on your design goals. What kinds of unique pairings could you discover by combining objects with unexpected motions? The eighth contrast in motion is natural motion versus artificial motion. Objects that we find in nature and objects that humans make tend to move differently, and that's one way we tell them apart. A rectangle that moves like an airplane can convince the viewer that it represents an airplane. If the rectangle begins to flap like a bird, it can easily be interpreted to be a bird because we are familiar with how these things move. The ninth contrast in motion is convincing motion versus unconvincing motion. This one is probably the most critical of contrasts, as creating believable motion takes a lot of skill and careful observation. If a design calls for a swinging chain, it should swing in a way that we find convincing. If it doesn't, it will distract the viewer from the intent of the designer. This doesn't necessarily mean that the motion must exactly match a swinging chain. It just needs to be believable, and some mimicking of natural movement might be necessary. The tenth contrast in motion is solid versus fluid motion. Fluids, which include liquids and gases, can be transformed the same way that solids can. Translation, rotation, scale, and color changes. Liquids and gases have their own unique ways of changing over time, and realistic fluids must appear to follow their physical rules. While some solids can also be difficult to animate, they tend to be easier than fluids. The eleventh and final contrast in motion is tension versus resolution. This contrast is complex and has a few subcategories, but basically, it has to do with the kinetic and potential energies of objects and how they move from higher energies to lower energies and vice versa. The first subcategory is inanimate tension and resolution. This involves objects that are not alive or don't move on their own power. They are acted upon. For example, a boulder at the top of a hill is in tension because it has a lot of potential energy. We know that something could affect that boulder and cause it to convert its potential energy into kinetic energy and find a resolution at the bottom of the hill. Conversely, we know that if it is at the bottom of the hill and something lifts it higher up, it has returned to a state of tension. 
The second subcategory is character tension and resolution. This includes any object or character that can generate its own energy. It can act upon other objects or itself. Character tension and resolution is much more dynamic and can be used to great effect. The principles of motion design provide a framework for any design that involves motion. Remember that motion is a complex design element. Take care to keep the principles of motion design in mind to achieve motions that convey meaning and purpose.